Hi, I'm Jim Cunningham. Today, we're going to talk about self-directed IRAs, and this is what we call high-power investing. So this is a strategy other than your traditional uh, Roth and traditional IRA. I'm a lawyer. This is not legal advice, so this is a disclaimer. Don't watch this and go out and do a bunch of stuff. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're doing this live, but this will be published on YouTube. And if you um, are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and then also hit that little bell and then you'll be alerted when we post new content. We have offices in Northern and Southern California, and we've got a team of seven lawyers uh, currently in our firm that are devoted entirely to all things um, estate planning, trust administration, retirement planning, the whole gamut. And this is certainly within, um, you know, IRA, self-directed IRAs are definitely within our wheelhouse. I'm the uh, CEO of Cunningham Legal. I've got over 25 years experience. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law. I'm also a certified uh, real estate broker and securities and insurance licensed, and I'm a pilot. So I just released our second edition of Savvy Estate Planning. Check it out. It's on Amazon. It's also available through our website. Uh, if you go on our website, it's pretty easy to navigate cunninghamlegal.com. So let's talk about self-directed IRAs and self-directed 401ks. This is a comes up a lot with clients. Um, a typical IRA arrangement limits your investment choices. And uh, it's limited to publicly traded stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and annuities. Uh, you can invest in Apple. Okay, but that's a typical investment in an IRA or a 401k, an individual stock. Apple's a publicly traded stock. Something to note is that the um, retirement plans are, are tax advantaged plans. It means that you know if you invest in Apple and it goes up, you can buy and sell in that IRA. You're not going to be paying any tax. You pay tax if you are paying any tax at all. You're going to pay that when it's distributed to you. And these are heavily regulated by the U.S. Department of Labor. So. There's some, some do's and don'ts that we'll cover in the, um, the self-directed IRA materials here. So what about alternative assets? Well, what if you wanted to invest in real estate in your retirement account or cryptocurrency? Now, this is where I put a little asterisk on this because the Department of Labor is considering not letting people invest in crypto, but right now there is no prohibition. Uh, or startup companies, precious metals, um, and other sort of non-traditional uh, retirement account assets. Uh, you cannot invest in these with a typical IRA or 401k. So if you roll your IRA over, let's say you're working at a company and you roll that over and you're with one of the big institutions and you say, hey, I'd like to invest in real estate, they're going to say, you can't do that with your normal IRA account. You've got to do a self-directed account, which is a whole nother universe. And that's what we're talking about. And we're going to talk today about how to set up a self-directed IRA and the care and feeding. And you know what's really important is the do's and don'ts. So we're going to talk about what is an IRA. We're going to talk about how to set it up. We're going to talk about the care and feeding, and we'll give some examples. And if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A, and we'll, we'll get to those. So, uh, so what is an IRA? An IRA is uh, an account that's typically set up at a finance, financial institution or through your employer, which in turn sets it up at a financial institution. That lets you save for your retirement. So this is I is individual retirement account. So if you're married, each spouse could have their own IRA. So this is an individual retirement account set up for your retirement on a tax-free or tax-deferred basis. So there are three flavors, three big spaces of IRAs. When we, when we look at these, the traditional IRA, this is where you contribute earned income. This is the $6,000 a year number uh, that you may be familiar with. You contribute earned income. Take a tax deduction, maybe we'll give you an example of why you wouldn't. And then that grows tax deferred until the money's withdrawn in retirement. So this is for a retirement account. So if your plan is, hey, I'm going to do a self-directed IRA, I want to make a bunch of money, and then I want to take that money out before age 59 and a half. There are a lot of special rules that cover that. Um, and you may be subject to penalty. You may not. There's, again, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of different approaches to taking withdrawals out of an IRA. A Roth IRA is where you pay the tax before you put the money into the IRA. So a traditional IRA is you take an income tax deduction uh, and with a Roth, you've already paid taxes and that goes into that IRA and that can go up to any value. And when you take that money out, it's not taxed. So this works for some people, doesn't work for all people, but it works for a lot of people. And then there's a rollover IRA. And that's when you roll over your 401k into a traditional IRA. So those are the three big buckets and I would say if you're looking at this saying, well, Jim, I don't have an IRA, I have a 401k, that's where your 401k is. Your 401k likely one day will become a rollover IRA. So those are the three big IRA buckets. And the biggest tax benefit, frankly, is, is the compounding of interest on a tax-free or tax-deferred basis. That's why people save for retirement. That's how people get these multi-million dollar retirement accounts. They exercise discipline during their lifetime. They may make a contribution as an employee. There's an employer match. And by the way, if you're employed and you have a 401k or you have a kid who's employed, 
and there's a 401k and an employer match, please <laughs> contribute to that account. Okay. Please have your kid contribute to that account because that's just free money. You know, uh, my son works at a company and they match 6%. So he puts in 6% of his pay. He gets a 6% match. It's a, it's a free money basically. So what, let's give you some examples. Andy, we have Andy, Betty, and Charlie. Andy contributes 6,000 in 2022 to a traditional IRA. Uh, and because Andy itemizes his deductions, he deducts that 6,000 from his income. Betty, on the other hand, contri also contributes 6,000, but Betty contributes to a Roth IRA because Betty does not itemize her deductions, okay? She takes the standard deduction. Um, and so it doesn't even make sense to put it into a traditional IRA because you're, um, you know, you're not getting that deduction. It makes sense to put it in a Roth IRA. And then Charlie rolls over his 401k from Big Corp uh, Inc. into a traditional IRA. And this has no tax consequence. So when you separate from a company, uh, many clients leave their money, uh, their 401k with the their prior employer. I'm not sure that's a great idea. Most people tend to roll that over. So what is a self-directed IRA? Well, it's a type of traditional or Roth IRA. This, you don't really see this with the employer um, uh, space as much, but this is going to be a traditional or a Roth IRA and allows you to save for retirement. Again, also on a tax advantage basis, completely tax-free if it's a Roth, tax-deferred if it's an IRA. You have the same IRA contribution limits and the default is a traditional um, or a Roth IRA. The default is not a self-directed IRA. Okay, so in, in the financial advisory space, you have to do take a lot more steps to get the self-directed IRA. If you want to invest in in assets that are not publicly traded securities, um, I would say look at uh, you know typically it's going to be real estate um, that our clients are looking at. Uh, I would look at the self-directed IRA. We will talk a little bit about physical gold, and there's a, a real warning toward the end on um, taking physical possession of assets. That's a big no-no. It's what we call a prohibited transaction, but we'll talk about that. And um, the self-directed IRA allows you to have these things that you can't have in a normal IRA. What can you have in a self-directed IRA? Well, you can have LLC interests, limited liability companies or limited partnerships. You can have privately held securities, at least for now. And typically an LLC or limited partnership is a privately held security. Uh, you can have foreign real property, domestic or foreign real property. So um, that's something to consider um, is, is the sort of this broad latitude and foreign real property, you know, for some people might be, might be something to consider a residential commercial real estate and raw land. So raw land's an interesting one. Um, it does not have the depreciation that that um, other other commercial properties and, and multifamily have, uh, but it's something to think about in terms of a longer term retirement play. Notes and deeds of trust. So this is like hard money lending, private loans. That's where somebody might lend somebody uh, money. You, you just can't do that in a traditional um, IRA. And crypto, again, at least for now, and physical gold and silver. So how do you, what's involved in setting up a self-directed IRA? Um, here's, here's, you have two components, well, really three components. There's you, you have a custodian, and this is the person who you designate, not you. This is the custodian. This is the person who really has possession of, of, these, uh, of these assets because you can't have them yourself. So you have to designate a third party. That is somebody who has custody of either the real estate, and let's use real estate as an example, no custodian is going to want to deal with the real estate. They're going to say, you know what, set up an LLC. You can be the manager of that LLC, but the shares of the LLC, the membership units are held by the custodian, but you can still be the manager. You can still be um, collecting rents. You can do a whole bunch of stuff. And this is how most people, when they do invest in real estate um, using a self-directed IRA, they will have a custodian and they will have an LLC. So we're going to use as the chassis, the platform, this LLC, because it really, um, is, is functionally a better vehicle, a little bit of care and feeding, but I think it's a more efficient structure and frankly gives the, um, the self-directed, the owner of the IRA, significantly more control without running afoul of the rules. So it's, it's really good. So in our example here, we have the self-directed IRA and that um, contributes money to the LLC. And you as manager, you can receive rents, buy properties. Um, you, know, you don't have to deal with the 1031 exchange, which is kind of cool, right? You can buy and sell property without being, having that constraint. Uh, but those shares of that LLC are held by the um, custodian, as we as we mentioned. So the LLC owns a property instead of uh, you owning the property, right? Directly, you own shares of the LLC that are held by your custodian. The advantage of an LLC is tremendous flexibility um, versus a corporation okay, or, a, or a partnership. 
a limited liability company, a limited liability company is, is a superior vehicle for holding real property or most of these um, investments that we're going to talk about. You do not have the corporate formalities. You don't have the requirement of an annual meeting. Uh, you have creditor protection. You have anonymity. I mean, there are a lot of good benefits to this. Um, the downsides, uh, again, are the care and feeding. And then you also have your state fees and your tax filings. So an LLC does not uh, file typically a federal return, but they will have to file a state return. And um, so the shares of the LLC, as we said, are held by the custodian. So you set up the IRA, you put money into, your, um, into this vehicle, the shares are held by your custodian, and the IRA is the sole owner and owns 100% of this IRA LLC. So it doesn't have other partners, but it owns 100%. And um, the IRA custodian will require some special terms that are in the operating agreement, and we work with custodians to, to make this happen. You can be the manager of the, of the LLC, but this is a really common question. Can I get paid for it? The answer is no. You can't get paid if you're the manager of the LLC and there are no prohibited transactions. Those are what are called deemed distributions. So if you run afoul of it, you know, if you have a million dollars in your IRA and you take physical possession of the gold that you bought, okay, that is deemed a, a full distribution. And there's an IRS case that just came out this year, little old you know, retired couple, unfortunately took physical possession of gold of, of gold bars, gold coins, that was deemed a distribution and they had to pay tax. Uh, you should work with an, uh, a CPA and a lawyer who has experience with self-directed IRAs um, and, uh, and, and, and the custodial managed accounts. So this is really a team effort. We talk about our A team, we talk about the attorney, financial advisor, CPA, I think on this one, we'd add the IRA custodian as well. So it's definitely somebody who's, who's part of the team. Again, you can be manager of the of the LLC, and those LLC LLC shares are are held by the custodian. Um, the IRA custodian may require a special advisor, and and this is really important because the IRA custodian doesn't want to get sued, right? Because if it's a deemed distribution, you you engage in a prohibited transaction, you may turn to the custodian and say, "Hey, you weren't doing your job." So oftentimes they'll require a special advisor. So that's going to be an attorney or a CPA. And um, they're making sure that you're not stepping in it. So I would really encourage you, if you are considering a self-directed IRA, this is not entirely a do-it-yourself project. Part of this is, you know, obviously managing the IRA, the uh, the LLC. You're doing on your own time. You're doing that yourself. But when it comes to, you know, do I take physical possession of things? What, you know, can I employ my kid to work on the house? The answer is no. Right? You cannot employ. Um, uh, those those classes of people to to work on on the house. So these are things that require a little bit of training, and you do need to have a a, a bench of people, right? It's, that doesn't have to be that deep of a bench, but you should have this sort of a team that you can go to and say, "Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Is this going to be a problem?" Um, the prohibited transaction. Uh, by the way, if you breach, if your operating agreement says you cannot take physical possession of stuff or you can't hire your kids to work on the house. Breach of the operating agreement, it does not constitute a defense. So um, it may be a defense on a lot of other things, but when it comes to the IRA rules, it does not. So uh, brokerage firms act, act as custodians for many types of IRAs, but most household name brokered, and you can think of these people, you know, you see the ads on TV, they, most of them do not offer self-directed IRAs. It's a space they choose not to get into um, for whatever reason, probably a business uh, reason. Uh, and th so there are separate companies that's, that specialize in self-directed IRAs. Um, some banks and trust companies handle certain investments that others won't. So I think before you just run out and pick a a, um, a company to a custodian to hold these assets, you need to figure out what you're going to be investing in. So if you're investing in crypto, one custodian may say, there's no way I'm going to get involved with that. If you say, I want to do real estate, and you know there may be some people who do that, some who don't. So I think that's something you need to do your research on and your due diligence find out which custodian handles which types of, of assets. So I think that does require a bit of shopping around. I would really also consider you to, to get a financial advisor with experience in um, self-directed IRAs. And that's on the due diligence and investment side. So you really have to be careful not to step in it. Um, and the custodians, they typically don't offer this. So that's something that I would say, engaging somebody who's um, part of that A team that we talk about, you know, the attorney, financial advisor, CPA, IRA custodian, important to have a dialogue with them to make sure that you don't um, have any problems. So once you find an IRA custodian, you open an account and contribute money just as you would uh, with any other IRA. And then that money flows into the LLC. This is sort of the flow of funds. You put, you know, you do a rollover IRA for a million. 
And then you give that to the custodian. The custodian puts that million in the LLC and you go out and you buy a, an apartment building, whatever it is. So let's um, talk about what not to do. These are some no-nos. I always think it's helpful uh, not only to know what to do, but what not to do. Very important. And we get the upside down swoosh there. Um, there are some forbidden transactions um, when it comes to self-directed IRAs. These are uh, collectibles, art, you know, stamps, certain coins, um, alcoholic beverages, right? And antiques, life insurance, S-corp stock. Those are not allowed to be held by a self-directed IRA. So it's really important when you create that LLC, an LLC can be taxed as an S-corp. It can be taxed as a disregarded entity. It can be taxed as a partnership, but you absolutely do not want to have that um, classified as an S-corp because that'll blow it. And this is part of this, you know, you don't know what you don't know, right? And you cannot uh, transact with a disqualified person. Well, what is a disqualified person? Jim, what are you talking about here? The IRS says a certain transactions are prohibited. And if you do them, it's not like you're going to get arrested. If you engage in a prohibited transaction, it's a full distribution of your IRA. So if that million bucks you put into your IRA on a rollover you know, from your 401k, you don't want to deem distribution because guess what? You got to pay income tax on that, that million dollars. So in California, that's over 50%. So the, a transaction, by the way, includes a sale, uh, a purchase, sale, lease, exchange, loan, an extension of credit, services or goods. Okay. So transaction, a very broad term. This isn't just buying and selling. Okay. This is actually um, performing services. So a disqualified person does include you, right? You are a disqualified person. So is your spouse, children, and parents. Um, and also you can have uh, some affiliation rules here um, as long as you don't own more than 50% of a company. So if you're going to do work on your house, or, or let's say you have a self-directed IRA, you buy a piece of property and you say, well, my son's a contractor. He, I'm going to have him work on that house. He has to own 50, less than 50% of the stock of that, uh, of that contracting firm. So if he owns 100% of it, you know, you can't do an end run around that and say, well, it's my kid's company. It's not really my kid. No, nah, it doesn't work that way. So um, disqualified persons, you, spouse, children, parents, disqualified person, I think it's important to look at what a disqualified person is and who is excluded. Well, siblings, you can do a deal with your brother, your sister, aunts and uncles, uh, in-laws, and then other distant family. So um, something we need to talk about is this uh, UBIT is what we call it in, um, in our space, which is unrelated business income tax, okay? Uh, you might also see it as UBTI, which is unrelated business taxable income, but really what we're talking about here is UBIT, unrelated business income tax. This is um, ordinary income received by a retirement account. Now, there are some exclusions to this, but this is really important, and it's really important you understand these rules before you start engaging in transactions because you can get stuck with the tax bill. And you know, The whole point of tax deferral is to defer the tax. You don't want to do something um, that is going to give you a surprise and cause you to pay a tax bill. So unrelated business income tax, um, LLCs and limited partnerships with net ordinary income, which is box one in your K-1. Um, many successful LLCs and startups have negative net income. Uh, the sale, of, and this is important to note, the sale of an LLC unit for gain is exempt from UBIT. So in, in this sense, if you do an investment, let's say you go into a startup, they're not making any money. They go through a couple series of rounds of, of funding. Maybe you're bought out a little bit um, or, you know, when there's an IPO, whatever it is. When that happens, that capital gain is not UBIT. But if you're getting distributions of income, um, so if you have a self-directed IRA into, you know, uh, the business that your cousin's running and you're getting dividends and it's an S corp, you're going to have a real problem. You're going to be paying, first of all, you can't have that in your, in your self-directed IRA, but if it was some type of other dividend paying um, um, stock, you're going to have you're going to have an, a problem here. So interest income. So these are some ex freebies. These are exemptions. This is what's not counted. Interest income. If you make a loan and somebody pays you ten thousand a year interest, that is exempt from UBIT. Rental income is exempt from uh, UBIT as well. Unrelated business income tax. So uh, any any rents from real or personal property now. I mean, you could do theoretically equipment leasing. We don't really see that a whole lot, uh, but it's got to be a, um, a financing agreement uh, versus something else. So a little bit of detail there. Uh, all capital gains are excluded and dividends from a C-Corp are also excluded. So these are some, some freebies there. Um, so let's look at some examples here. Andy wants to invest in LMNO 
um, corporation, which I used to think was one letter of the alphabet when I was seeing my ABCs as a kid. I think everyone did. Uh, so Andy wants to invest in a startup. Andy, Andy needs to be careful to avoid the, any prohibited transactions. If Andy is merely an investor in Elemento Corp, with no other involvement. So he's not doing anything other than placing money. He likely won't engage in a prohibited transaction, but if he's already a board member or an officer, so if you're working at a, <laughs> at a startup, right? Um, or a VC funded type of, of structure, and you're actively engaged uh, as um, a board member or an officer, you really need to engage a lawyer to make sure you don't run afoul of the prohibited transaction rules. And if it has no um, ordinary income, then there's no UBIT. And again, a lot of these startups don't have income per se. Um, but uh, again, the dividend income from a C Corp is exempt anyway. And let's see here. it's exempt anyway, as is the capital, uh, the sale of, of, uh, of stock realizing a capital gain. So those are excluded. So the problem is, when you have an operating business that maybe is a disregarded entity or some type of pass-through entity, um, you could potentially have um, some income tax traps. So you need to be you need to be careful. You need to be mindful if you're going to do some a VC space. Um, again, uh, talk to talk to a lawyer, CPA that are you know that'd be us at our firm uh, who's got experience in this. So uh, let's like talk about real estate uh, real estate investing with a self-directed IRA SDIRA. So Andy wants to buy Greenacre. Um, Andy's IRA LLC is owned by his self-directed IRA. So this is the structure where Andy is the manager of the LLC and the custodian holds the shares. All real estate has got to be in the name of the IRA LLC, not in Andy's name. So this is really important. Andy shouldn't go out and buy this on his own and think he's doing it you know, with his self-directed IRA. The IRA LLC um, captures all the income, all the expenses, and nothing goes into Andy's pocket. So this is really important. So Andy can't take a rake. He can't say, well, I'm going to be a property manager and I'm going to charge a fee. You can't do that. Okay. So this is, this is really important. You're going to, you're going to run afoul of these rules. So Andy's self-directed IRA owns the property, not Andy, right? That's really important. So he's not the owner of uh, the, the shares in this LLC. His self-directed IRA is and he and disqualified persons cannot physically work on the property. So if he wants to go mow the lawn, that's a problem, right? If he wants to do some repairs himself, that's a real problem. He's, he should hire a property manager to handle collecting rents and making repairs. And then the property manager can send checks um, to the IRA LLC, not to Andy individually, right? You got to run it through the LLC. And really the LLC is the optimal vehicle um, for administrative convenience frankly, and, um, and asset protection reasons. So you want to like limit the liability to that LLC. Um, and if you have more than one rental, consider having multiple, having one LLC for each, each rental kind of makes sense. So let's look at um, lending money with a self-directed IRA. So Andy's IRA lends, can lend money to Charlie, who's Andy's cousin. C is cousin, right? Andy's cousin, Charlie. Uh, because Aunt, Charlie's not a disqualified person. Remember, parents and children are. Andy cannot lend money to his son, um, Sam, because Sam is a disqualified person, really. So it's really important if you're looking at these IRA, self-directed IRAs, you need to pay attention to who you can um, transact with and who you cannot. Charlie, remember the cousin, then pays the IRA under the promissory note. He's not paying it to Andy. So Charlie's going to pay it to the LLC. And Andy's LLC, not Andy, is the lender. And Notes can have lump sum. They can be monthly. You can write up a note any way you want it, right? Um, and he can get points in interest. He can really uh, squeeze his cousin, I guess, on on the fees and and the charge for the loan, and um, also participate in the appreciation of real property. So he could say, "Hey, Charlie, I'll lend you money, and we'll um, agree to sell this in five years, and I'll lend you money at maybe less of an interest rate, and then." Um, get some of the upside. So a lot of latitude on this. And, and this is really a great way, you know, if you want to invest um, in, in this manner, there, there's a, there are a lot of creative strategies you can use. Uh, but again, you need to get that A team together so, so you don't inadvertently step in it. Uh, so a disqualified person as a manager, this would be you, if you're, if this is your self-directed IRA. Um, you can look for investments. You can um, look for things other than your stocks and bonds. And as we do this, you know, the stock market and the bond market uh, are kind of um, down, right? That's sort of an understatement. Um, so I think a lot of people are looking at, at other types of investments that maybe don't have the, the, the risk 
uh, associated with uh, publicly traded um, stocks and bonds. You can perform all the tasks, all the administrative functions and oversight tasks as the manager. Um, you can receive as manager, not individually, you can receive income and write checks from the LLC. So it's no different than if you appointed a third party as the manager of the LLC. You know, if you appoint uh, Mike as manager of your LLC, you're not going to want Mike to be able to just take money out and put it in his pocket. No, no, that's embezzlement, right? So the same deal here is you are working as the manager of the LLC. This is not your money. This is your retirement account's money. So you can't, you cannot be, um, you know, profiting in that sense. Um, you can do everything you need. Sign documents, uh, handle all the investments, hire contractors or professionals. Again, you cannot pay yourself or disqualified person compensation. You cannot personally benefit from the LLC's investments. And that's really, really important. So, and these are scrutinized, okay? This is something that um, I, I think gets, gets scrutiny. Some things get less scrutiny. I think these get a little bit more scrutiny. You cannot commingle your personal funds with the IRA funds in your LLC bank account. So you can't say, well, I, I've got this LLC bank account. I'm going to just add some money to it. No, it, it doesn't work that way. You have to go through the route of the custodian. You have to go through the custodian first to, to put more money in the LLC. So get your A-team. This is what we keep beating this drum. You need your A-team and your A-team is typically your attorney, a CPA, financial advisor. They're the three-legged stool. And I think when it comes to self-directed IRAs, we might have a fourth leg in there, which is the IRA custodian. And that is the end. And we have a couple of questions here. If you have a question, go ahead and um, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Uh, so the question is, so can I take money out of the self-directed IRA at 72? Yeah, not only can you take money, you have to take it out at age 72. So this is one of the issues. So if you're approaching minimum distribution um, period of your life, if you have a self-directed IRA, you have to have these assets valued as of December 31 every year, and you have to take out your minimum distribution. So if you have real estate, you may not have sufficient liquidity, okay? Or hopefully you would, uh, but that's something to be mindful of. And also you're gonna have to have that property valued every year. So that does um, that does add to the care and feeding of, of it. Jeff says, do you have do you have any self-directed IRA custodians that you recommend? Uh, Jeff, great question. I think it depends on what you're doing. So if you're, if you're, it depends on the class of asset that you're investing in. Some are better than others, but it's certainly something if we talk to you, um, you know, we can certainly help you with that. So here's our YouTube page. I would really encourage you to take a look at our YouTube page. We have tons of content on there and we're pretty much for a month we're, we're putting out on, on YouTube. If you'd like to um, schedule a consult, you can go to our website and click the orange button, schedule a free call. Um, and we can connect you with, um, we do a free 15 minute call to see if, if we can add value or not. And then, um, and then they can kind of direct you on, on who to speak with. And go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, this is a great way to stay familiar with everything. And visit us. If you, if you like what we're doing, please go to one of our, uh, please go to our Google uh, business page. You just type in our name and it pops up and uh, write us a, a nice review. I'd really appreciate that. And we got a couple more questions here. So Walter asks, what do you do about rental real estate expenses if there's not enough cash in the self-directed IRA? That's a problem. Uh, Walter, and and this is you know this is why you have to kind of look at this. If you're coming up short on cash, you might have to make an additional contribution. You might have to structure it as a loan. This is really um, something that you want to make sure you have adequate cash flow to meet your obligations. Okay, because this is a really a closed system. So one answer might be to have to make another contribution, the six thousand dollar contribution, whatever it is. Uh, or do a roll IRA rollover and a consolidation, but um, that is a real uh, a real issue, Walter. All right, so we've answered questions. Any last questions? And would the LLC LLC or self directed IRA be appropriate for a live aboard boat? Um, you could, James, but you can't live there, right? because that would be a take, essentially taking physical custody. But yeah, if you want to have a live aboard boat and rent it out to somebody, that's fine, but you cannot use it, okay? Um, and then can the self-directed IRA take a mortgage out to buy real estate? Yes, Walter, that's absolutely correct. Uh, most, most lenders, you know, you're going to probably get, you, will, you can get financing on rental property based upon the cash flow, all right? So if you're buying a piece of property with a certain cash flow, they lenders will typically lend to you based on the projected future income from that property. So it's hard to say, 
what can you get on terms of a multiple loan to value? The most we see on an LLC is 65% loan to value, maybe 60. You might have to have some, some other cash on deposit with the institution in order to get that number. Uh, but 50% is, is kind of the starting point. Uh, but again, it depends on the cash flow. As raw land, you're gonna have a hard time getting any financing on that, quite frankly, because there's no income. So Lucretia, I saw that. You just give us a call again, uh, give Jamie a call. And that brings us to the conclusion of our webinar here today. And uh, go ahead, subscribe to our YouTube page, and we'll see you in next time.